Hey, boss. How are you? Hi, Professor. Who else is here? I think it's just us. Because there's no jobs. I'm going to play games. Mama, because I'm going to have to leave. And she wants to go run around the block, but that sucks. I hate going around the block. I love biking instead. You can go. We still have one minute. Where are you in lab now, guys? I mean, uh, in class, sorry. We're doing cardiac right now. Okay, did we cover dysrhythmias already? I don't think so, no. No, okay. Um, tonight's class, what's it going to be on? I didn't expect that. Um, recess that you had last week. But you finished um, ACS, the AD heart failure? Yes or no? I don't, I don't think so. No? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's begin. We have, um, who's here? We have Mr. Williams. Uh, McCrane's here. Yeah. Three four seven five four three zero eight nine nine. Who is that? That's Sandra. Oh, hey, hi, Sandra. Hi. Okay, so let's begin now. All right, it's already two, I think. Yeah. All right. Okay, let me begin with. Um, this written. Can you see my screen, chapter 35? Yes. Okay, let me... Uh, I don't have access to the screen. To, to so what? I'm just listening, is that okay? Sandra, hello? I don't have a screen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, are I'm you... just listening, is that okay? You in with a, on the phone? Yeah, I came in on the phone. Um, isn't there a... Because um... there's a Zoom app, actually. Oh, I don't have that app. Okay, I can try to download it. Yeah, just quickly download it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, I'll come back out. Yeah, I'll come back out. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay, guys, let, let okay, me, yes, let, let me now, 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 now
it's not really, it's not really, uh, it, it, I mean, it wasn't expect, I mean, it wasn't expect. I hear echoes, I hear echoes, I hear echoes, like microphone. Yeah, maybe, 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 Okay, it's gone. All right, so I was saying uh, the class won't be as with any other class because my contact with the street, obviously they were capturing his best moments trying to keep the morale of the country high. It's interesting just because it sounds like uh, the protocols in the UK are, are similar to how they are in the United States, which is um, if you really only get admitted in the United States if you're having trouble breathing, Really, I think we can hear you. Um, you're watching uh, the lead, J Jake Tapper. Uh, after being examined, I was told to go home and rest. Um, yes. Really yeah. Room. Okay. So for um, EKG interpretation, this won't be a telemetry class. A telemetry class is two weeks long. Uh, even a telemonitor class, you know, those monitor texts, the class they take, it's three days. Plus, in both programs, they have homework to do uh, even before they attend the class. So this is basic rhythm interpretation, okay? Uh, again, you see my screen, correct? Yep. Yes, I can see it. I can see it. All right, All right. so uh, let's do uh, basic. So on your exam, I doubt if... Dr. Grant will give you questions on variations in the rhythm. Um, I specifically, I mean, I personally, if I um, give a question on yeah, uh, rhythms, I would use only strips that are either on your textbook or strips that are closest to the pictures that are on your textbooks because it, it's I mean I don't think it's fair to show you variations because uh, you most of you don't have the experience okay so there will be uh, a few variations on AFib for instance AFib can look like um, three different ways uh, for, for AFib uh, but there are similarities so let's begin these Properties mentioned in Table 35.1, I encourage you to read it. These are, because during fetal development, when, you, when we were embryo, embryos, uh, as the heart developed from one single stem cell, I mean, it, it, the whole organ, the whole heart came from the same stem cell. So at one point, most of the cells shared the same characteristics, but however, as soon as the heart starts to develop, they lose some of those properties and differentiate. As they differentiate, they become specialized in some way. So for instance, automaticity are now exclusively um, possessed by the pacemaker cells. Now we have three pacemaker cells, namely the SA node, which is the primary pacemaker. Then we have your AV node, which is the secondary. And we have the tertiary, which are your uh, Purkinje fibers and the left and right bundle branches. Excitability is this common among all cells in the heart, uh, regardless of their function. They're all excitable, meaning they respond to the electrical impulse that is generated by the heart. Unlike skeletal muscles, wherein skeletal muscles can't function without nerve innervation, right? That's why. If you have, if you suffer a spinal cord injury, your muscles become useless because there are no nerve impulses supplying them. Not so in the heart. Heart has its own action potential, meaning there's some truth <coughs> how you see in the movies wherein somebody rips somebody's heart out and the heart continues to beat outside the body. So meaning if as long as there's blood supply to that heart, it will continue to beat. Uh, conductivity, uh, this is again a common property. All cells inside that heart conducts electricity or electrical impulses. However, contractility is only possessed by the muscle cells in the, car in the myocardium of the heart. So uh, to recap, automaticity and contractility 
are exclusive to certain um, cells in the heart, but all cells in the heart are excitable. They are, uh, they still possess conductivity. <clears throat> Let's go straight to, because we have no time to explain this one, the, the Eindhoven Triangle. Uh, to summarize though, that's why uh, a 12 lead EKG, which is the basic minimum you need, now we have 24 leads, we have 36 lead EKGs now, but the basic one, which is the minimum to make a diagnosis is a 12 lead EKG. Now a 12 lead EKG only has 10 electrodes though. There are 10 electrodes giving you 12 views. So when you say lead, lead means two things. Lead can be interpreted as view, lead can also be interpreted as the electrode, meaning there are uh, electrodes are the leads that you put on the patient's skin. Now, again, a 12 lead AKG has 10 leads. You put one on each limb, each arm, each leg. That's, uh, those are the four limb leads. Then you have six chest leads. The six chest leads are V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So plus uh, four that are put on the extremities, so that makes wow. 10 leads or 10 electrodes. <clears throat> on the 12 lead EKG, which is figure 35.3, this these are now the 12 views. Okay, so we have leads one, two, three. AVR, which is the lead on the right arm. AVL, the lead on the left arm. AVF is the lead on the left foot. Now, you see there is no right foot here. There is a lead on the right foot or like right leg, but that is only a ground lead. Okay, doesn't measure anything. <clears throat> then we have the six leads, B1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You'll notice easily that on each lead, the patient's rhythm or the waves and complexes don't look the same. The reason is the, the leads or the electrodes are looking at the heart from a certain angle. So if you go back to this illustration here, this is how the um, negative and positive uh, electrodes of the EKG um, communicate. So of course, this one is the, the AVR is negative then the AVF is um, positive, so they communicate. And because the heart here in the mediastinum, right here, uh, let's look for an illustration, um, not there. Let's see if I can draw. So here, Right, so let's say this is your your heart, and this is um, Michael's shoulders. I mean, or Robert's shoulders. Okay, so this is your SA node right here, located on the right atrium, and this is your ventricular septum dividing the left and right side of the heart. The AV node is right here. And this is, of course, your right and left bundle branches. So since the direction of the electrical impulse is going this way, so this is lead one, this is lead two. On a triangle, this is lead two, lead one, lead three. The lead one, I mean lead two, is going in the same direction as the electrical impulse, which is uh, the, the action potential of the heart. Meaning every heartbeat starts from the SA node. The electrical impulse travels from the SA node down to the AV node and then down the left and right bundle branches. 
So since it is in this direction right here, lead two is usually the lead that is um, the basis for when you go back to here, all this, almost all the strips that are in your textbook are usually taken from lead two. This one's from lead two, okay, here, lead two. Um, because it's the most, um, what, 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 um, say, um, the most accurate uh, rhythm. Again, see here, lead two. So all the references are usually from lead two. Sometimes we'll use V1, uh, but most likely all illustrations on your textbook is taken from lead two. I'll explain more on this uh, shortly. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so again, think of a 12 lead EKG as 12 different photographers looking at the heart from different angles. So if you look at the lead placement here, it's, it's, it's like the, the uh, photographer, one photographer is situated in, in each side. Okay, so from lead one, which is from AVR to AVF here, that's one view, and then at the top here of the triangle, like looking down from the head, that's another view. And then from the left arm down to the right uh, leg, that's another view. And then each one of these guys here, as they interact with different electrodes, again, takes you, gives you a 360 view of the heart. So to make a diagnosis, for instance, if you remember, I don't know if you covered this already under acute coronary syndrome. Um, you, did you, did you uh, see a uh, EKG changes during an MI under acute coronary syndrome? Wherein there were three changes. You had a ST elevation, T wave inversion, pathological or abnormal Q wave. Do you recall those terms or not? Hello? Are you with me, guys? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay, all right. My mic was. No, on. I don't. Remember seeing that? Uh, no. Okay. Um, yeah, we're on the chat. No. Okay. I think um, acute coronary syndrome is under chapter thirty-three, right? Okay. If I have time later, I'll I'll show you what those look like. Okay. I'll I'll move on. Again, to summarize the twelve lead EKG, there's no way to let's say going back again to acute coronary syndrome. So how many acute coronary syndromes do we have? Under chapter 33, what were the three acute coronary syndromes? Uh, Smiley, Kevin, Myocardial, myocardial, um, MI. Okay, um, SBMI, right? Very good. What else? Um, UA. Um, Unstable angina. All right, very good. And um, let's see. I said um, MI, UA, and. Non STEMI, right? Non STEMI, okay, yeah. Okay, all right, so those Sorry, are. I don't have my notes in front of me. I'm, I'm operating from my phone. I just um, came back and saw with my son. Oh, that's okay, man. Um, by the way, who are here? I got check attendance. I have Sandra. Sandra's here, right? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, yeah she's here. So I have Robert, Crane, Cardero, Kevin. Simmons, Anthony, is Maria here?
I'm a, I'm a text her, professor. She in my clinical group. I'm going to text her right now. Okay. Right. Oh, you're on here both uh, twice, Robert? You're on your phone and on your computer? Yeah? I can't. <laughs> yeah, Robert, you're here twice, right? I, how about now? Did I take it off? I think I got it off my phone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's, okay. All right. Okay. Um, so there are three acute coronary syndromes. Now, the why they call it acute coronary syndromes is it's practically impossible to tell them apart. That's why they call them collectively as uh, acute coronary syndrome, because the only way to tell them apart is to draw. I mean, to to measure an EKG. So you have to obtain an EKG and then you can tell them apart. Okay, another way to tell them apart is to draw blood also. However, uh, the blood may show uh, the same cardiac enzymes, whether you have uh, um, unstable angina, uh, STEMI or non-STEMI, because all will indicate myocardial injury. So to some extent, it will, it, they will all show uh, troponin elevation. The degrees, of course, the level of the troponin will, will uh, vary, okay? So again, to, that's why we need an EKG is to tell apart what, which acute coronary syndrome do you have. Until we know that though, until we get an EKG, the patient's diagnosis will just be acute coronary syndrome. But once we get the EKG, then the doctor can make a diagnosis. Oh, this is an M, this is a STEMI, this is a non-STEMI, or this is angina. All right, let's go now to interpreting. Okay, an EKG paper has horizontal lines and vertical lines. For our purpose tonight, we will only be concerned about the horizontal line. The horizontal line is time in seconds, and then voltage is represented by the, the vertical axis. So the time in seconds, again, is the horizontal line. There are three second markers on an EKG paper or a cardiac monitor strip. Um, even if they're not there, they're just there for quick reference. But if they don't appear, then you'll have to do it manually. So here, we magnified one big square or one big block on an EKG paper. Each small block right here, one small block measures 0 0.04 seconds. So therefore, if there are five small blocks in one big block, so here, one, two, three, four, five. So how many seconds is one big block, Smiley? Again, each small block, this one tiny block here, measures 0 0.04 seconds. So how many seconds is one big block, which has one, two, three, four, five small blocks? 0 0.2 seconds. Very good. So that's 0 0.2 seconds, which is 0 0.04 times five. So therefore, in an EKG paper, how many small blocks are there in one minute if each small block measures 0 0.04 seconds? So let's go 60 divided by 0 0.04. What do you got? Uh, 2.4 seconds. 1,500. 1,500. Okay. Uh, again, the question was, how many small blocks, tiny blocks, are there in one minute? So if each small block here, this one tiny square here, measures 0 0.04 seconds in one minute, which is 60 seconds, how many small blocks are there? So we divide 0 0.04 into 60. So 60 divided by 0 0.04 seconds equals 1,500 small blocks. Now, 
what if we go big block? So this one big block here, one big square, this one. How, if that one big block is 0 0.2 seconds, how many big blocks are there in one minute? Three hundred. Very good. Three hundred. Now you may ask, what the hell is the significance of this? So you'll see it later when we start counting the heart rate. Uh, when we count the heart rate, by the way, it's all estimates because we will only be using a six second strip. Uh, why only six seconds? It's practically impossible to analyze a one minute strip because we won't have enough space on the um on at the nurse's station you simply won't have enough space to lay it out so you only need six seconds why six seconds because six times ten equals 60 seconds so it's easier to do a six second strip when i say cardiac monitor strip it's not an EKG strip. An EKG strip is this one right here. A huge paper, this is the size of a eight and a half by 11 paper. So it's big and it's giving you 12 views. Now the cardiac monitor, which you've probably seen in clinical if you worked in telemetry, those patients with telemetry boxes only have five electrodes giving you three views. So they're only giving you leads one, two, and three. So it not only is it limited, but it's um, um, it, it, it's it's going to be quite long if we do a one minute, okay? Because that's again so long. So if you look at these three second markers, if like I said, if you don't see this on the exam, let's say. Uh, Dr. Grant <laughs> uses a strip on the test question, but it this didn't carry. No problem. You can just count it. So we know each big block is how many seconds again, uh, Simmons? This one big square here is how many seconds? 1,500. No, no, no. Uh, one big 300. Block. Oh, you're talking about 0 0.2? Yep, okay. okay. So one big block is 0 0.2 seconds. So therefore, every five is one second, correct? So yes. Like one, two, three, four, five, that's one second. One, two, three, four, five, that's two seconds. One, two, three, four, five, three seconds. So these are your three, three second markers. So again, on a test question, if they're not putting these three second markers here, then just manually count it. So that's three seconds there, another three seconds here. Are we clear so far with the, uh, with the paper? You understand what the paper represents? Again, for interpretation purposes, we're only concerned about the horizontal axis. Okay? We, we're, we're concerned about the time. Okay, I'll, sh I'll, I'll keep explaining and you'll see why. All right. Excuse me, Professor, I have a question. Yeah, this is Maria. Maria. Okay. Do I have to pay for the Zoom? It's asking for me to upgrade. Uh, no, it's just because um, you're not the host. You're only an uh, attendant, attendee anyway. So you don't need mm -hmm. to control the time. I mean, I already paid, so only the host will pay. Attendee. How come I, I, I try to click the link uh -huh. and then it asked me to download i was able to download it but i couldn't locate the, the meeting like everything else is um like not the links are not working and mm -hmm. then i finally yeah and the only thing that works is if i pay like no no a you don't amount. Pay. no it shouldn't um give me your email i'll send the invitation Okay, thank you, Professor. Now, give me your email. Oh, Tangonan Maria at Gmail. Tangonan, is it dot Maria or Tangonan Maria? It's, it's just straight. Tangonan Maria at Gmail. Oh. 
Okay, just sent it. All right, let's continue. Okay, so this is, uh, before we go to dysrhythmias, we have to take a look at what does a normal sinus rhythm look like? Okay, the proper term is sinus rhythm, not normal. You can say normal, but the proper term, the official term for a normal rhythm is sinus rhythm. Why is it sinus? Um, because... The way I described it earlier, all electrical impulses must come from the SA node for it to be normal, meaning each heartbeat must be initiated by the SA node. Again, this pacemaker is your primary pacemaker. This is located on the right atrium. This thing is capable of generating 60 to 100 beats per minute. That's why it is the primary pacemaker. We have a secondary pacemaker maker called the AV node. This one though is not very efficient. It can only generate 40 to 60 beats a minute. And the most inefficient are the right and left bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers that run along the ventricles. These things can only generate 20 to 40 beats a minute. So for a um, rhythm to be normal, has to come from the SA node. Uh, with me so far? Yes. All right. So this is a normal sinus rhythm. There are, yeah, question? No, no, I was saying I'm with you. Okay. So uh, heartbeat, the lub dub has the following waves and complexes. It must contain a P, a Q, R, S, and a T wave. So there are two waves here, the P and the T wave, and then we have a complex called the QRS complex. We'll discuss what each wave represents, but again, a complete heartbeat, which is uh, one lub dub, S1, S2, is made up of a P, Q, R, S, and a T wave. Table 35.2, let me minimize so it will make more sense. Okay. Table 35.2 gives you the measurements. These things, guys, though, you have to memorize, but there's not a lot of numbers to memorize. Okay, there are only a few. In fact, uh, the P wave isn't normally memorized, but uh, go ahead, it's 0 0.6 to 0 0.12. So that means this is uh, one and a half to three small blocks on the, on the EKG paper. And it tells you here what each wave represents. So if you see a P wave, this thing represents atrial depolarization or atrial contractions, okay? And the P wave must be upright. It must not be an inverted. So the P wave is right here. This little, tiny little wave here represents atrial contraction. If you see a P wave, that's very good because if a P wave is representing atrial contraction, that means where did the impulse come from? The SA node. The SA node, very good. So the P wave is very important. So let's say we talk about AFib later. In atrial fibrillation, there are no P waves. So therefore, what's your only conclusion? Is, are the signals coming from the SA node? No. You don't see P waves, absolutely not. Where did they come from? We have no idea. The only thing we're sure of that it did not come from the SA node. Okay, so that's the significance of a P wave. The PR interval, this is now uh, still the time. This is the time between from when the signal 
or the electrical impulse was generated by the SA node to when it traveled and reached the AB node. Its normal measurement must only be 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds, or that's three to five small blocks. Again, one small block is 0 0.04 seconds. So the PR interval must be between three to five small blocks or one big block maximum. PR interval. Confusing because of the R. R is right here. However, the PR interval has nothing to do with the R wave. It's measured from the P wave, so therefore it includes the P wave up until the beginning of the Q. Which brings me to the next topic, which I didn't mention. If you look at the strips, um, here, for instance, look at this one and this one, uh, A and B, or even this figure here, 35.12. In all these rhythms, there, there is an imaginary isoelectric line. Isoelectric meaning iso, um, neutral, uh, electric, you know, uh, electrical impulse. Um, it's an imaginary straight line from where all your waves and complexes leave and return. Again, um, or otherwise stated, uh, it, it's, it's an imaginary line from where your waves and your complexes start and end. So it doesn't really fall on a solid line. It never falls on a solid, solid line, like this one, for instance. The isoelectric line is slightly above this solid line here. Okay, and that's how we measure the waves and complexes. So for this example right here, this one, our isoelectric line, well, this is not a real EKG. This, is, was, this was just drawn for illustration purposes. So it never falls, like this one is real. Okay, this is a, an actual um, rhythm. See how it never falls on a solid line? This one does, because again, this is only for uh, illustration purposes. So our real reading never falls on a solid line. So there's an imaginary straight line somewhere here from which all your waves and complexes start and end. With me so far? Okay, so if we uh, measure this thing, the PR interval here is measured from right here to right here because this is where this is the point where the the Q wave started to deviate from the electric line. So the Q wave measures right here. It starts here. So therefore, the PR interval is technically called the PQ. Okay, it shouldn't be. I mean, if you ask me, it should be called PR interval, but you know, they, they call it the PR interval. So again, the PR interval is um, measured from the P to the beginning of the Q. Now, what is the significance of the PR interval? So it tells you here, um, imagine, let me go back to the whiteboard. If the impulse from the SA node reaches the AV node right away, which it does, um, imagine lightning. So, Anthony, Sandra, you've seen lightning, right? Yes. From when the lightning struck from the sky until it hit something on the ground, did it take a long time? No. No. So heartbeats, electrical impulses from the heart, is like lightning. So you think it will take a long time for the electrical impulse to travel from the SA node to the AV node. 
No, it's not going to take a long time. Absolutely no, no daylight, right? You, you, as soon as you see it, oh, there it is. Okay. So imagine if, because when the SA node fires, that will make the both atria because there are interatrial branches here. We can't see. So uh, as soon as it's generated, it will cause both left and right atria to contract. And of course, it's an electrical impulse. It's of course uh, transmitted straight to the AV node. And then the AV node, of course, if, if it didn't do its job, it will transmit that signal right down to the ventricles, correct? Now imagine the disastrous effects that, that, that could result if the atria and the ventricles contract instantaneously, will there be cardiac output? Meaning if the atria and the ventricles contract together at the same time, will there be cardiac output? No. Uh, no cardiac output because the blood in the atria right here has to fill the ventricles first, right? before the ventricle should contract. That way we have a unidirectional flow of blood. So therefore, this is the one job of the AV node. The AV node holds on to that signal or to that impulse. The AV node, you can say, is a gatekeeper. So this is um, the PR interval, therefore, is a delay. That's the PR interval. This is a necessary delay so that there's time for ventricular filling. But that delay is how long again, Robert? How long is that PR interval delay? From the P to the Q, right? Yeah, from when the SA node put the, I mean, uh, from when the impulse, electrical impulse traveled from the SA node to the AV node. On the EKG? Yep. Uh, you said uh, three to the fifth of those small squares. Three, three to five small squares. Or what's the measurement there? How many seconds? Was it a 0 0.2? 0 0.12 yes. to 0 0.2 seconds. All right, very good. So this is again table 35 that's that two. You can see my book, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that is the PR interval. So is the PR interval important? Yes. Because if there is no PR interval, will there be ventricular filling and will there be cardiac output? No. None. Okay. So we want there to be a delay. This delay is, again, very important for the blood to, to fill the ventricles before the um, ventricles contract. So that is the one important job of the AV node. I'm not saying it didn't receive the impulse. It did. It received it, but it did not. It chose not to transmit it down to the bundle branches yet. It decided to hold on to it for 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds, allowing blood to enter the ventricles before it will transmit the signal. Now, if I ask you, if the heart rate increases, okay, so let's say this one, we're going a little bit ahead. So, um, Smiley, if a PQRST is one heartbeat, and this is a six second strip, which you can easily multiply by 10 equals 60 seconds. How much is the heart rate on this particular strip? If this is one heartbeat, this is one PQRST, another PQRST, another, 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 and another. What is the heart rate here? So is this one heartbeat? This one right here? Yes, no? 50. No, this is one, two, three, four, five, six. 
times 10 equals? 60. This is a 60. heart rate. The heart rate. <clears throat> now you may um, argue, well, why did you count this one? This is an incomplete heartbeat because I only see a P, Q, R. I don't have a T here. That's correct. But you see the space here between this three second marker and from this P wave right here. So can I move this here so that maybe I can accommodate the T wave that is missing here? Yes or no? Yeah. Yes, I can do that because there's plenty of space here. So if I move this P wave right here, the start of this P wave up to here, maybe the start of this three second marker, I have plenty of space to accommodate the T wave that is that fell outside this marker right here. Understand? Um, excuse me, professor. Yes, sir. Why are you um, multiplying it by 10? I think okay, I missed that part. This is only a six second strip. Mm -hmm. So times 10 equals 60 seconds. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what is the 10 for? Yep. So six times 10 equals 60 seconds. So it would be again uh, impractical to use a one minute strip. It's very long. No textbook will be able to accommodate a six uh, a sixty second strip. You get it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for interpretation purposes, all your exam will only show a six second strip, and this is a six second. So you have three second markers here. One, two, three second markers. Clear? Yeah, but like, what's the ten for? Do you always measure the multiply the strip by ten? Yeah, because again, this is six seconds. So mm -hmm. we need, yeah, we count the heart rate per minute, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the reason. So again, it's okay. Not uh, I see what, I see what one you mean. minute here. It'll be very long. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so, I see what you mean. Right. So we only need a six second strip, and then because whatever results we get multiply by ten, we have sixty six sixty seconds. Okay. okay. All right, All right. Very Thank you. We did the P wave. We know that this is representing uh, atrial contraction. And then we have the PR interval, which is nothing more than a pause. This is a delay from when the electrical impulse coming from the SA node to when it is transmitted by the AB node. So that's, again, a very crucial delay. So it's a pause. The QRS complex is a... Uh, is representing your ventricular contraction. So you see, again, the um, vertical axis measures the voltage, right? So look at, imagine how much electrical activity there is during ventricular contraction. So you can see the strength of the ventricles compared to the strength of the atria. If the atria, if the atrial contraction is represented by the, by the P wave, Imagine how much electrical activity difference there is when there is during um, atrial versus ventricular contraction. And look at this. The, the next wave is the T wave. So if QRS complex is representing um, ventricular contraction or ventricular depolarization, when it was discharging the electrical uh, charges that, in, that is inside the cell, the T wave is the repolarization. And as you can see, the electrical activity is still significantly higher compared to the P wave, to the electrical activity in the atria. Now, we've talked about atrial depolarization, ventricular depolarization, and ventricular repolarization. Now for the atria to contract on the next P wave, it has to repolarize, correct? Mm -hmm. Do we see atrial repolarization anywhere on this EKG? <coughs> Do we see it represented by any wave? 
The answer is nothing. So do we know when the atria repolarize? No. No, but it has to have repolarized, right? But because the electrical activity is probably too, too, uh, too small, because look at the, the P wave, the size, the height of the P wave, it's only that high. So therefore, if it's that, that, that insignificant, how more, much more insignificant is the repolarization, right? So mm -hmm. we know it repolarizes, we just don't know when or where it is, but we know it repolarizes, otherwise there would be no subsequent heartbeat. Next is the, S, um, the ST segment. ST is this part right here. So this is the QRS. So it's the distance between the S and the T wave. This is the ST segment meaning it's usually isoelectric, meaning there is no electrical activity in the ST segment. So it's this isoelectric section right here. Okay, so in the MI, instead of having a P, Q, R, S, T, so this is your ST segment right here. In the STEMI, it would look like this. So instead of this S wave right here being a downward deflection and the ST segment, which is this one, instead of this being isoelectric, this is now elevated. So let's look at what the ST segment represents. Read this for me, Robert. Okay, so the ST segment measured from the S wave of the QRS complex to the beginning of the T wave represents the time between ventricular depolarization and repolarization uh, should be isoelectric. All right. So um, it's simply the time, right? <clears throat> so this is like a resting phase by the heart. This is the only um, rest that your heart can, your particularly your ventricles take. So in between beats, it rests for how long? Zero point twelve. Well, right. Right. Three three Zero small squares. Point. Right. So there is no electrical activity for 0 0.12 seconds between heartbeats. Now, if this is what happens in an MI, wherein the ST segment is not isoelectric, it's elevated, is the heart resting in between heartbeats after an MI? if it is not isoelectric, it, if it's elevated like this. So is the heart able to rest during or after a heart attack? No. No. There is still a lot of ventricular irritability. That's what results in an ST elevation. So you can see clearly the heart is unable to rest. So will it have enough oxygen in order to um, does it have oxygen in order to burn for the next um, heartbeat that follows no no and then the, the 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 process is perpetuated every heartbeat that follows after an mi so that's what results in your ischemia the, the coronary arteries um, die, I mean, the, because the coronary arteries are blocked, the heart cells die, that's why you have an infarction and necrosis. The T wave, this is the last wave. This it is, it is representing ventricular repolarization, meaning it's starting to become more positively charged now, all right? 
um, another, and then finally you have the QT. This is simply at the time between the QRS to the end of the T wave. Um, I doubt if they'll uh, test you on the QT. Now, what's the significance of the last column on this table? Now, Dr. Grant may ask you, like this one, for instance, on the T wave. What if she shows you a tall peaked T wave? A tall peaked T wave is usually from hyperkalemia. What if the T wave is inverted like this? So instead of an ST elevation and still a normal T wave, in an ST <clears throat> STEMI, it actually will look like this. Meaning from a fluid and electrolyte imbalance, right? So, no, this one is no longer, um, uh, you can see the whiteboard, right? Yes, yeah, this one, no, uh, if it was, um, tall peak T wave, meaning it's really high, like almost as high, let's say, I oh, I raised it. Um, so if I have a T wave like this, mm -hmm. okay, almost as high as the R wave, this is hyperkalemia, meaning it is very irritable and uh, resulting in highly, you know, um, very high electrical activity inside the heart cell okay, because the, your your potassium is positively charged, right? So that means you have more potassium inside that cell, causing it to have a huge electrical activity. So the T wave as a result. This one, however, this one right here is an inverted T wave, meaning is there any electrical activity there? Because yeah. In, yeah, because this, this is a, a STEMI now. This is an SDMI, ST elevation MI. The T wave inversion here is representing that the, the heart, that means are the ventricles able to repolarize after an, a massive MI? Because remember, the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. And it has to be a positive deflection. But in this instance, it's not a positive, it's a negative deflection. So is there repolarization here? No. No, it's not happening. Okay, so this is, uh, that means your parts of your ventricle specifically, it could be either the left or the right ventricle, they're dead. Okay, so you have dead muscles in there when you see an inverted T wave. With me so far? Yep. Okay. All right. So uh, familiarize yourselves with these. The four, what is this? The third column of table 35.2. Again, the measurements because Dr. Grant could give you questions wherein she won't give you a strip. She will just give you the measurements. Okay. The measurements of the waves and complexes. So you should, you're expected to know what are the normal measurements for each wave and complex. All right, clear? Um, like this one, for instance, the QRS interval or the QRS complex should be less than 0 0.12. Okay, it should, it should not be wide, nor it should be, uh, nor should it be too narrow either. Uh, table 35.3 are practical steps, meaning for every strip, you're supposed to ask yourself these questions here. There are 10 steps. The first step is always look for a P wave. Are there P waves? What's the significance of having a P wave again, Mr. <clears throat> Simmons? Why is it important to have a P wave? Because uh, it, 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 
Right, that means the where did the electrical com impulse come from? Exactly. The SA way and the SA node, right? So P wave yeah. represents an electrical impulse coming from the SA node, resulting in a normal atrial contraction. Next, number two, <clears throat> this is the regular regularity or irregularity of the wave. Um you guys have a piece of paper there somewhere, right? So with your paper, because we don't have a caliper, okay, we were supposed to have a caliper, but those things cost eight or $10. So we'll use a poor man's caliper. So grab any sheet of paper, put it sideways, and mark the distance between this R wave here and this R wave. Did you pull up a piece of paper and mark? where these R waves fall? Let me know if you did that. Yes, no. Got it. All right. So move that piece of paper with those markings and then measure from this R wave to this R wave. Is it the same distance? Yes. Do the same for this one, from this R to this R. That one's a little shorter. Uh, but is it significantly different? I mean, I guess is, not. Is the difference like more than uh, two tiny boxes? No. no, not even one. Okay, so again, from this R to this R, and then from this R to this R. About the same, right? More or less. All the right. last one seems short. Okay, well, no, no significantly um, major difference, right? No. So we just did the two steps. So we looked at P waves. So clearly uh, this strip here, we see P waves right here. They look the same. P waves um, are present. And then we looked at the regularity or irregularity of the rhythm. So um, because they have the same distance, um, we can say the rhythm is regular. Next step is to count the heart rate. All right. I showed you the... <clears throat> A basic way to count the heart rate, which is to count the P waves, the R waves, or the T waves in a six second strip. So we did this one, two, three, four, five, and then the reason why I included this, although this one is missing a T, is I can easily move the whole thing here and it should accommodate enough room for the T here. So I can say the heart rate here is 60, right? Because six times 10 equals 60. Now, this is only good if our rhythm is regular like this one. What if our rhythm is irregular? Now comes the other method. Another method of counting the heart rate is measuring the num counting the number of big blocks and counting the number of small blocks. Which one do you want to do first, big blocks or small blocks? Big blocks. Okay, let's do big blocks. And we said how many big blocks are there in one minute? 300. 300. So in order for this to work, let's look for an R wave that, small, that falls smack against a solid line. So which one? Number one, two, three, four, five, or number six? Number one. number one is close enough, right? But as you can see, it didn't really fall on a solid line. It's more on the middle, right? Between this solid line and the first small blocks. It's right there in the middle of that. But it's close enough. So if we count the number of big blocks between this R wave to this R wave, how many are there? One, two, three, four, five. Can you say 5.2? Because this is also in the middle. This is caught between 
between uh, two small lines and this one is also between two small lines so we can it's emotionally hard to prepare for this level of sickness and suffering yeah okay who's that okay so for this one how many uh kevin how many big blocks would you say one two three four five point what five point two Okay, so let's say 5.2. So divide that into 300. How much you got? So 300 divided by 5.2. 57. All right. Is it close enough? 57.7. 57. 57. Yeah. Yeah, as long as, again, the, uh, I said this from the beginning, these are all estimates because are we examining a whole six-second strip here? No, we're only using a six-second strip. So it is all <clears throat> an estimate. These are all estimates. Mm -hmm. So 57, 60, that's close enough. Now let's try the small block method. Uh, Maria's turn. How many small blocks are between, um, let's use the other strip. Let's use this R right here to this R. How many small blocks are there? One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. So we know that in a big block, five, so we can say 5, 10, 15, 20, and that's 26. 22, and 26. yeah, okay, 26. So 26, divide that into how many small blocks in one minute? 300, uh, 26. 1,500. 1,500. Yeah, it's about the same exact thing. 1,500 divided by how many did you say? Mm -hmm. 26. Divided by 26 equals? That's the same thing, 57 points. Okay. So whichever method you take, we arrive at more or less the same number. Um, I don't know if Dr. Grant will use a definite number or a range. So let's say he gives you this strip and then ask you how many... Is this, is this rhythm's heart rate? Because she doesn't know what method you're going to use, whether you're using the R, counting the R's method, counting the big blocks, or counting the small blocks. Right? She doesn't know which mm -hmm. you're using. So she may use a range. So her choices might be A, the heart rate is 60 to 70, B, it could be 50 to 60, or C, it could be 70 to 80, or D, could be 90 to 100. All right? Uh, with me, guys, so far? Any questions? Yes, we are. Counting the heart rate, the methods. Again, three possible methods. You simply count the number of, of uh, R waves in the six second strip or count the big blocks between two R waves or counting the small blocks between two R waves. Step number four is measuring the PR interval. Let's try another strip. Let's look at this one. Um, Troy, count the, measure the PR interval of this, this heartbeat right here. Okay. So the P wave starts here and the Q wave starts right about here. How much does that measure? How many seconds is that? Um, so that's four blocks, four small blocks. One, 
two, wait, one, two, three, four. Yeah. I would say uh times zero point zero. Zero point two. Zero point one six, right? Times uh zero point is zero point two times four? No, zero point one small block is zero point zero four seconds, right? Times four equals zero point one six, yes. All right. Is it between zero point twelve and zero point two seconds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, right? Yes. So normal? Yes, it's normal. But count the heart rate in this one. This one, letter A. Count the heart rate. Whatever method you want to use. Letter A. Which one? B hey, um, count that heart rate. Heart rate is uh, <clears throat> no. second. So this is a good example. You have three second markers here. So this is six seconds. And how many do you see? You can use the R, counting the R's method, counting uh, the big blocks method between this R and this R, which is perfect, or counting the small blocks between this R and this R, whichever method you want, you prefer. Hold on one second. You said one block is six seconds, Professor? One small or big block? The big block. Big block is 0 0.2 seconds. Because okay, so one small block is 0 0.04, and there are four, five small blocks in one big block. So 0 0.04 times 5 equals 0 0.2 seconds. Uh, okay. Oh, I'm getting I'm getting something less than sixty. What did you get? I'm getting like around forty-eight. I got thirty-seven. Yeah, forty is correct. Oh, okay. That's so, this, there are yeah. This is a, you can count this one right because this one has has a complete uh, heartbeat. So this has a P Q R P. <laughs> P Q R S T P Q R S T P Q R S T. So all falling within this six second strip. You said 40? 40. Zero? 40. Yeah, depends again on the method you use. So if I use the R, counting the R's method, I would say the heart rate is 40. But if you, if you use the big block method, so between this R and this R, there are how many big blocks? One, two, three, eight. four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. Divide that into how many? 300. 300. You get. Your, your answer's right, Kevin. <clears throat> All right. It's so a little bit less. Something, right? That way. Yeah, 37. Yeah, something. 37. Which is still within the... Um, 40. Yeah, within um, mm -hmm. the range. Okay, It's not more than 5 or 10 difference. And it, the same thing. If you count the small block... Uh, small block, so we have 1, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. 40. Buy that into 1500. You'll still get 30. 7.5. 37. So still within the margin of error. 
It's easy, right? Okay, let's try this next one. Count this heart rate. 140. <clears throat> so let's see if Maria is correct. So this is the P wave. So we'll count this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. We can't count this one because this is missing a T wave. I can only say 130. Oh. Right? So again, How do you know it's missing a P wave, Professor? Yeah, because this is the T wave. This is the T. Oh. And that's a P. So 130? Heartbeat here is missing a T, so I can't count this. This is an incomplete heartbeat, so I can't count this. So within my six uh, six second strip between these three second markers here, I can I can count this one right here, the first one, because I see the P wave right here. So I can count this one: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Mm. About one thirty. Yeah. Other method. So this one falls smack on a solid line right here. So between this R and this R, how many big blocks between them? 2.1. 2. Well, 2.5 is here, so I would say maybe 2.2. .2, right? Oh, yeah, that's what I got. Okay, so 2.2 .2 divided into 300, how much you got? 136. Still 30. So let's try small blocks. So between, let's try this R right here and this R. How many small blocks are there? 5, 10, 11. 11.5, I think, yeah. 11.5, divide that into 1,500. What was that record? Um, McCrane, what you get, sir? Hello? <clears throat> Anyone can answer, Professor? Yeah, Anthony, what's up? Yeah, 130. That's All what right. I got. So it's still within the margin of error, all right? Yeah. So we counted the heart rate. Let's go back to our steps. So we... We looked at the P waves. How do I get rid of this? Ah, okay. Oh, okay. So we looked at the P waves. We measured the regularity or irregularity. We calculated the heart rate. We measured the PR interval on that sinus Brady. Let's measure the PR interval on the heart rate, which is 130. This one. So the PR interval here is in this which starts about the isoelectric line is about here, this one. So the P R interval is from here to here. The measurement. Um, Anthony. So from here. I, I can't see where you're pointing, Professor. Uh, right here. So I'm on this one right here. So the P R interval for this wave right here. This one to right here. What's the measurement? Oh. Oh. Uh, okay. Is it within 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds? Is it within three to five small blocks? Can you point yeah, just about. real quick, Professor, my screen? Okay. That's, uh, better from this one right here. So this is the P waves. Zoom in. Uh -huh. From the P wave, that P wave to where? To so this point right here, which looks like your Q. 
the beginning of the queue. So from here to here, how many small blocks is that? Two. It's more than two actually because you started here. Oh, five, one, two. So about three, right? Three, yeah. Okay, so is it within 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds? Oh, over there. <coughs> yes, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. So the only thing wrong with this trip is what? Because we saw P waves, we saw that there are PQRSTs, we saw that the T waves are positive deflections. The PR interval measures between 0 0.12 seconds to 0 0.2 seconds. So is there anything wrong with this trip? With this rhythm? And if we measure the regularity, if you have your poor man's caliper again, your piece of paper, if you measure from the distance between these R waves right here, are they more or less normal? I mean regular, sorry. No, they're not regular. Like if I measure, I'm measuring right now between this one and this one. Yeah, it's about the same. There's about um, two and a quarter big blocks between each one. Two, two and a quarter, two and a half big blocks between each R wave, between R waves. So I can say, yeah, it's, it's about regular. It's occurring at the same time. It's regular, but the person has a medical condition, though. Well, yeah, yeah. we don't know that. We don't know that. We, we just know what's the only thing wrong with this, with this rhythm. It's fast. It's too fast. It's more than 100. Look at letter A. What's the only thing wrong with letter A? Because you measured the PR <laughs> interval was normal. We have a P, Q, R, S, T, and the T waves are positive. Our S, T... Yeah. Uh, segment is isoelectric. So what's the only thing wrong with this rhythm? Too slow. No, not right. Okay. So which brings us to the first two stepsisters of the normal sinus rhythm, which are the sinus brady and the sinus tac. So the hardest part here, guys, is really understanding the basics of these steps. Because once you know, you're familiar with these steps, you can answer all the questions. Possible question, uh, this one right here is uh, artifacts. These are uh, meaning your electrodes are loose. That's the only reason you see these, meaning uh, somebody put it on uh, probably a hairy part of the body or the patient's sweating. You know, you have no, you have poor contact with the electrode. That's why they look like that. So. There's no way to interpret this. Okay, so this is an artifact. So you just simply clean the patient's skin, make sure your electrodes are sticking properly. Uh, I mentioned these earlier. These are the intrinsic rates of your pacemakers. Again, your primary pacemaker is the SA node, capable of firing 60 to 100. AV node is a secondary pacemaker, only capable of 40 to 60. And bundle of branches, let's not even talk about that because that won't be enough to support life. I mean, who lives on 20 to 40, right? So you can forget about that. 35.5 are common causes of dysrhythmia. Either Dr. Grant can do this or she'll go specific, which is most likely. So she'll give you a strip, a cardiac strip, your job is to interpret or identify what it is. And then the question might not be as simple as that. Her question might be, nurse walks into a patient's room, sees this rhythm on the monitor. The nurse knows that the, which of the following are possible causes of this dysrhythmia. Or she'll may, maybe ask you, which of the following are possible signs and symptoms of this dysrhythmia? The good thing about dysrhythmias is the signs and symptoms are the same because in any dysrhythmia, what happens to your cardiac output? Uh, 
uh, the cardiac output will decrease. That's it. So therefore, regardless of hypnia, what is their cardiac output? Whether it's sinus, you go ahead. You say regardless of the dysrhythmia, yes. what is their cardiac output? It's always low, right? Yeah, exactly. So the signs and symptoms, if you go into each into each dysrhythmia, which is now your your job, their their um, signs and symptoms are the same. That's why you have common. Uh, causes, although again, Dr. Grant's most likely going to ask you specific signs and symptoms for, I mean, causes for each dysrhythmia. However, the signs and symptoms are the same. Table 35 that 6, these are, um, these are the common signs and symptoms. Look at, again, look at the pattern of column 1. Are they consistent with those of um, decreased cardiac output, which is what you saw in heart failure when you discussed it under um, chapter 33? Yeah. Right. Yeah, these are all signs of decreased cardiac output. You have hypotension, and these signs of symptoms here, the cool clamp skin, the tachycardia, um, these are all sympathetic responses. These are common, regardless of the dysrhythmia, these are your common interventions. But we will go again with specific, okay? So we'll go through each one. I'll show you how to study. So we just did the normal sinus rhythm. So for each dysrhythmia, how I studied these guys when I, because your textbook didn't create a table, other textbooks, uh, created the table for you. Uh, this one doesn't. The author did not. So I suggest you make your own uh, table. The table should contain uh, column one, of course, the name of the dysrhythmia. Second column, I'll go with the causes. What are the causes? So here, sinus Brady, these are the causes. And that's very good question to ask with uh, select all that apply. Bless you. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. So, um, or you can take them collectively. So, for instance, what, it, what are vagal stimulations? When you say vagal stimulation, what activities cause vagal stimulation? Sinus. No, I mean, what activities fall under vagal stimulation? What, if, what about if you're inserting something up somebody's rectum? Oh, yeah. That's vagal stimulation. Okay, so that's the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve runs from your mouth down to the end of the rectum, right? That's why the the, nerve, the the term vagus means wandering. You know, it's a wandering um, nerve. It starts from the, from the mouth, ends in the rectum. What if you push it too hard? Can that stimulate it? Like if you like uh, somebody's constipated? Exactly. Here, Valsalva maneuver. Yeah. A vagal stimulation. Another is, let's say you are vomiting. Vomiting is a vagal stimulation. What about suctioning? If you're suctioning somebody, are you also stimulating the vagus nerve? Yes. Yeah, because you said it starts in the mouth. So uh, Dr. Grant may change the terms, okay? not tell you Valsalva maneuver. Well, if she, she just says, oh, the patient's trying to bear down, okay? It's constipated. Or this one. This is a procedure that uh, a doctor, I, again, I specify only a doctor can do a carotid sinus massage. So th the doctor is massaging one carotid, okay? Only one carotid at a time. This will cause vagal stimulation that will lower the heart rate. But again, only a doctor should do that. Our insurance, because that's not always safe, this can go into uh, the patient will have another dysrhythmia. 
Um, other causes are effects of your drugs. You give beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, which are twins. They all lower the heart rate and causes low heart rate. In fact, if you look at your common causes right here, two most common um, causes that lead to dysrhythmias are caffeine and smoking. So for you coffee drinkers there, you might want to um, you know, cut down on that because um, this one's under common, but uh, as you can see, if you the further along you get <clears throat> atrial and especially ventricular dysrhythmias, they're caused by coffee. Coffee is the most commonly used uncontrolled um, substance out there. Uh, in my opinion, it should be controlled like smoking, like Yes, sir. Can it be caused by pre-workouts too? Uh, depends on your level of condition. So let's say you're ripped like me, for instance. You know, I'm very jacked. Right? <laughs> so my heart rate tends to be lower. So yes, you're right. So jacked people like me uh, tend to have sinus bradycardia. Okay. Now the important but the, um, pattern. The pre-workouts have caffeine. Some of them have caffeine. Say again. Some of some of the pre workouts have caffeine inside. Well, um, caffeine is more. Of course, that's a stimulant, right? That's a um, that that most likely will result in a tacky dysrhythmia rather than a brady dysrhythmia. Now, especially these energy drinks that are out there. So yeah, like bad. I won't need the whole. Um, chapter for you. I'll just tell you how to study. Again, so my suggestion is a table. Create your own. Table number one is the dysrhythmia. You can also divide them into atrial and um, ventricular dysrhythmias. Column two are the causes. Causes, so list them down. This is an example. And then what does it look like? So just use your textbook, what does we, which we looked at it here. This is sinus brady right here, and that's sinus tachy. Just in case uh, you get the description. <coughs> no, instead of listing this on the test question, you may see an actual strip. Um, and this is the signs and symptoms, okay? And most important is the intervention, the treatment. As you can see, there's the first treatment isn't always a drug, meaning we don't always give an antidysrhythmic drug. It really depends on the patient's symptoms. Look at this right here. Thank you for reading, Maria. For the patient, can you hear me? Yes. For the patient with symptoms, treatment consists of giving IV atropine. If atropine is ineffective, transcutaneous pacing or a dopamine or epinephrine infusion are options. The patient may need a permanent pacemaker. Okay, the clue, the cue here is look at the first statement. For the patient with symptoms, so therefore, are all patients with sinus brady treated? Do they need treatment? No. No. Only if they are symptomatic. symptomatic. What are those symptoms again? Symptoms are right here. So if the patient shows these symptoms, what is your treatment? Which Maria just read. Pacemaker. Uh, no, a uh, pacemaker is uh, kind of like a last option. So it's in this order right here. So first option is always, yeah, the anticholinergic atropine. So you give that first, and atropine is ineffective, then you go with the pacemaker. Or um, um, sympathomimetic drugs like this one, dopamine and epinephrine. 
right? So those are also vasopressors. Uh, but again, read each arrhythmia, and the cue here is the symptoms, okay? If the patient has symptoms, then you treat it. But otherwise, look at the first statement right here. If bradycardia is due to drugs, meaning you identify the cause, so let's say here, these are the cause. If you can identify it, so if you treat the cause and eliminate the cause, then will there be, um, is it necessary to do therapy? <clears throat> no. No. So if you can identify and eliminate the cause and the patient and symptoms, then that's your only action. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And then you do the same for sinus tech. But again, my, um, my suggestion is to understand rather than memorize. So here, why does the sinus tachycardia? Uh, it tells you here by the description that this charge from the sinus node increases because of the inhibition or sympathetic stimulation. So therefore, what are equivalent to sympathetic stimulation? Exercise, pain, hypotension, all of these things here stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, one way to um, remember, okay? So you don't have to memorize. What about um, dehydration? which is not written here, but if she puts the question, uh, a choice as dehydration, is that in play? Yes. So, yeah. <clears throat> dehydration. Because of hypovolemia. Hypovolemia, hypotension. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. All right. And what else are emergency? Look at, look at this. Hypoglycemia is an emergency, right? That's a life-threatening scenario. An MI is a life-threatening scenario condition. Heart failure is life-threatening. So all of these will trigger sympathetic response. Hyperthyroidism, that's a metabolic disorder, of course, you know, just increase metabolic activity, so therefore you have an increased heart rate. And anxiety and fear, again, those stimulate your sympathetic nervous system, so it causes sinus attack. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a table, but they didn't write what we wanted you know no interventions no causes so i wish they made it like that instead mm -hmm. that one. Um, heart blocks by the way guys there are three uh, degrees uh, let me just um go to that quick so uh, this is what i mean by look at um a fib so this is a fib i mean not no, a fib that's p um, <clears throat> okay, here's um, a fib and a flutter. So this is a fib, <clears throat> letter B. This is a flutter, <clears throat> letter A. Uh, it tells you on the description that this is the only one of its kind. So this is the sawtooth uh, config, um, sawtooth pattern. You no, know, like a saw, like a you know the. the mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, that's the only rhythm that looks like that. Sawtooth, that's a flutter. Nothing else is like that. A fib, this again has many variations. A fib doesn't always look like this. Right? But the pattern again, how you study this is the, the cause. Again, I highly suggest make a table. All right? If you want, you can collaborate. You can say to each other, hey, can you make this? And then you, you um, consolidate your table. Okay, who, who makes the atrial dysrhythmias? Who wants to make the ventricular dysrhythmias? Who wants to make the heart blocks? Right? And always look at the, when you read the interventions, guys, especially AFib, because there are two problems in AFib. One, Let's look at this. There are no P waves, right? This is AFib. No P waves. And um, so therefore, is are the atria really contracting? No. There are no, no. So no atrial contraction. Is, so is the blood leaving the atria? No. So what will blood open? They hang around in one place? 
coagulate. Blood clots will form. So you have two problems in AFib. Number one is cardiac output drops because the atria are not emptying. And number two, because they're not emptying, that means blood is pooling in the atria and blood clots will always form. So your two problems there is maintaining cardiac output and preventing clots. And um, AFib is one of those that have many interventions. They have pharmacologic interventions. They have uh, surgical interventions, uh, other um, procedures, okay? So uh, AFib plus AFib is the most common dysrhythmia especially as we age, okay, this is the most common uh, um, dysrhythmia related to aging, okay, so chances are you and me, when we get old, we'll probably develop AFib. So look at it. it's very long. Okay, so here, treatment starts from here, down there, and that's just one, and there are options now. Have you heard uh, the commercial on Watchman? on TV. This is Watchman, left atrial app appendage closure. That's a surgical procedure. And yeah, and they also have um, ablation. Uh, you have the maze procedure there. We have cardioversion, okay, electrical cardioversion here, or ablation. Okay, so uh, AFib has several options. But look, always look at the, the, what is this? The order, okay? It's always like under uh, Sinus Brady earlier. We said, if the patient doesn't respond to this, then we proceed another option. Understand? Are you with me, guys? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So always read it in that order. So here, our first, uh, line of in treatment is always drug therapy. So we do calcium channel blockers or beta blockers and or amiodarone, digoxin, and then if they can respond to that, then we go with electrical cardioversion and so on. All right. Um, there should be a drug part also, which is another thing we study. It should be a summary of your blood. 5.9. Look at the third column. So these are anti dysrhythmic drugs. Look at the third column. What do they all do? Give me blood. Well, are they minor side effects? No. No. So look at it this way. These drugs are used to treat dysrhythmias, right? Mm -hmm. But look at the effects. What are they causing? Prolonged PR interval, wild and QR. Right? Mm -hmm. Basically, if you go down this chart, they all cause another dysrhythmia. Yeah. So that means they are pro dysrhythmic. Pro meaning for dysrhythmia and abnormal heart rhythm. This is one thing you should remember when administering anti dysrhythmics, they cause. They could potentially cause another dysrhythmia. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's common for anti dysrhythmics. And you saw them on the list that they are also causes. They're not only treatment, but they can also cause a dysrhythmia. And you look at the details here. Here, this is a difference here because this is the same machine. Defibrillation and cardioversion uses the same defibrillator. Um, the difference there is this one. If you're using the defibrillator as a cardioverter, 
this is the only difference. Turn on the sync button or the synchronizer button. If that button is on, then the machine is no longer a defibrillator. It becomes a cardioverter. Understand? So if it's on, no. the sync button, uh, let me show you. Uh, you know, you know um, a defibrillator, right? Um, no. Regular <laughs> machine on the crash cart, the one they use to deliver an electric shock? Yes. Yeah, okay. That machine is called a defibrillator. If the synchronizer switch is off, meaning there's a green, round, well, it's a button, yeah, it's round. Um, it's colored green and it says sync on it, S-Y-N-C. So if that sync button is off, that machine is a defibrillator. If somebody turns it on, it becomes a cardioverter. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, of course, defibrillator is used only for two rhythms. That's for VTAC, a pulseless VTAC, and uh, VFib. And cardioverter, of course, is for a fib, a flutter. Now, here, here, uh, here's the machine. So here's the, um, where's the sync button here? Uh, Right here, see below the shock button. Right here, that's S Y N C. Sync. So if that is turned on, this machine functions as a cardioverter, and it explains synchronized cardioversion right here. You know what you do. Of course, the patient is given a uh, because. Uh, can you handle it if you're awake and then they deliver a shock? They tell you, okay, are you ready? Here's the shock. Yeah? Would, you, would that be comfortable? No. Absolutely not. So we need to sedate the patient. So the patient will be given a small uh, short-acting sedative like um, Versed or Midazolam. So they're semi-conscious. You know, like uh, they're conscious, they're conscious, but they're sedated, if that makes sense, conscious sedation. Um, just for comfort, because this is uh, delivering an electric shock, so that has to be uh, given. All right. Um, and guys, we're out of time, but um, read your textbook. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send me text messages or emails. I'll answer when I can. This is being recorded. Can we download this? Oh, uh, the recording? Yeah, this. Uh, uh, sure. Yeah, I can. How do we? Can you send it? Because I've been I've been rewatching the other recordings. That's been kind of helpful for me. Okay, uh, and then uh, charts like this or tables like this. Look, these are teachings. Okay? So these are all testable because you need to teach the patient what to do if they have an ICD or if they have a pacemaker. Okay, these are practical. I use these all the time in a uh, select all that apply question, mm -hmm. right? Because they're so easy to make. Plus, you know, they're significant. They are um, uh, part of patient teaching. Right, there should be a separate table or chart for these makers. Uh, or maybe not. Oh, here it is. Yeah, so one for ICD, another table for pacemakers. They're kind of the same. Um, do you know about microwave ovens and uh, pacemakers? Oh, yeah, you can be. <laughs> Actually, that's um, not true. Read no. number eight. Um, microwave ovens are safe to use and do not answer. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Something, you know, we because we see these signs in city hospitals and those hospitals are 100, 200 years old, so they haven't taken down those signs. So these only, those signs only applied to pacemakers 100 years ago. Okay, so modern pacemakers do not, um, I mean, microwave ovens do not interfere with those anymore. Plus, we have modern microwaves now, so things have changed. Okay? So again, um, I encourage you to read um, cases like that. Any questions, guys? No. No, Professor. Do you have a test tonight? Tomorrow. Tomorrow.
Why tomorrow? When? Ah, your class is Wednesday? Isn't no, it? No, no. They, they just made it tomorrow. I guess because we were supposed to have it uh, last Saturday. And then um, if that fell within the recalibration. Ah, yeah. Remember, we didn't start classes back up until... Technically, the... Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it threw everything off. Okay. So that's why we having it. She decided to give it to us. Yeah, because everything just got thrown off. So she's just giving it to us tomorrow. Okay. All right, guys. Um... Uh, read the details, okay? Like, say, this one, VTAC. VTAC has two variations. VTAC can be a VTAC with a pulse, or it could be a pulseless VTAC. Management is different. All righty? All right, good All right. luck. Thank you. Um, don't forget to okay, see. good night. Yeah, I'll send the recording by email. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Okay, good night. Thank you. Right, good night, guys. Thank you. Good night.